Before we get into the video today, I just want to give a quick shout out to one of our sponsors, Gnostic TV. Gnostic TV is ancient wisdom reimagined. This is a Netflix for those who are spiritually curious and want a place to go where there is no censorship. I personally am doing a whole series on Gnostic TV called the Esoteric Explorer, where I am providing exclusive content to Gnostic. Gnostic TV is a host to all sorts of different content creators, many of whom are your old favorites. If you would like to check out Gnostic TV, there is a link down in the description box below. The Roman goddess Minerva is the goddess of wisdom, justice, law, victory, and she sponsors the arts and strategy. The name Minerva means intelligent understanding. Now, the Roman goddess Minerva is the equivalent of the Greek goddess Athena. Both Athena and Minerva have an animal that tends to follow them around, a familiar, you could say. In our current society, this owl has become quite famous with fringe topics, especially those involving secret societies. But before we go any further, you know what to do. Please hit that subscribe button and give us a like. As always, such a great big thank you to all of our patrons and our producers here on Esoteric Atlanta. Without you guys, this channel would not be possible. If you would like to help support this channel by joining our patron or our producer community, there is a link down in the description box below. Welcome to Esoteric Atlanta. My name is Bryce, and today we're going to be talking about the Owl of Minerva. Now, this is a follow-up video to our earlier video about the Society of Jesus and St. Francis Borgia, something kind of a subtopic that I definitely wanted to talk about. Now, if you missed that first episode where we broke down the Society of Jesus, a link will be down in the description box below. Now, if we follow the timeline of the Society of Jesus, we know that when, they, that when their power was revoked at the end of the 18th century, that is when we saw the rise of a particular secret society. The society we like to call it on this channel because of this platform, the Aluma Shmati. And the Aluma Shmati picked a particular mascot. And this, of course, was the Owl of Minerva. Now, we see this owl everywhere. We see it on our money. We see it on that little campsite in Northern California that I can't say on this platform, but y'all know what I'm talking about. We also see it in the layout of Washington, D.C. And, as you guys know, we have one of those owls on top of the TBS Center, or the old TBS Center here in Atlanta, Georgia. I'm, in, I'm downtown, well, kind of midtown Atlanta. So right in front of me is what we call the connector. That's the freeway. It's 75. It's where 75 and 85 meet. You can kind of see... Anyway, downtown's that way. So across the street, across the freeway, I don't know if you guys can see it, but that's the new, um, the new Turner TBS. Maybe I can pull my camera so you guys can see. So that's the new, newish Georgia Tech's over there, and this is the old TBS when TBS was first when uh, Ted Turner first opened TBS up here in Atlanta. I'm gonna get closer. You can kind of see the TBS sign right here. So let's find the owl so you can see the owl. Now the owl symbolizes knowledge, wisdom, and enlightenment. 
This is because owls notoriously can see in the dark. Now, I do have to remind you that owls themselves are not bad. Once again, we can't have this vigilante attitude where we have to destroy everything that the darkness has touched because then literally we would have nothing left. And remember, my friends, the darkness can't create anything, only the light can. So owls themselves were created by the divine creator, the same creator that created you and me. And of course, they were given a very specific talent, again, to be able to see in the dark and to also twirl their head around in a full circular motion. Now, again, Minerva is the equivalent of Athena. And in my personal opinion, this might be an unpopular opinion. This is just my own personal opinion because I have done a lot of look into the Greek deities, which Minerva's Greek counterpart is Athena again. And I, at this point in my life, am of the opinion that all of the Greek deities that we see were Nephilim. Now, I started to figure this out when I started first started to study the origins of Mardi Gras and Dionysus and how we see all of these, these sculptures of all these Greek deities these demigods you know we see them as being giants right they would these old structures and sculptures would show like us humans being these little little things and then there would be these gigantic people that were these greek deities now a lot of people will say oh that was just metaphor of our ancestors they were just showing the majesty of their gods blah 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 but in my opinion i think our ancestors were a little bit more literal i think they were literally telling us that these beings were giants were nephilim now again as i've said many times before we cannot judge a group of people just because that particular group has the reputation of not being so good. So even though I personally believe that the Greek gods were Nephilim, that does not mean that every Greek god was nefarious. Just like we can't say that every human being of a certain race is nefarious. You know, we, we have to be careful with that kind of black and white thinking. But nonetheless, Athena, as far as legend goes, was the daughter of Zeus. Now, Zeus, in my opinion, was one of the worst of the the gods of Olympia, of the, in my opinion, Nephilim. This guy literally took what he wanted without permission. He was going around shmaping women, we'll say. You know what the real word is. I can't say the real word here on YouTube, but shmaping women, taking what he wanted. Zeus was not good. In my opinion, through his actions, through his recorded actions, he was not good. Again, we judge people and beings by their actions, not by the group that they're born into. Well, Athena was his daughter, and she herself is also symbolized by owls, olive trees, and snakes. Now, I'm going to talk a little bit about Athena because the Greeks definitely had a very different relationship with their deities than the Romans. Similar but different, and Minerva, again, is the equivalent of Athena. So let's look a little bit at Athena's origin story. So her dad was Zeus. Now, Zeus basically kind of fell in love with this female goddess by the name of Metis. Now, Metis was a wise goddess. Her father was Titan of the Ocean. We think of water as being very emotional, and she had helped Zeus basically free himself from Kronos, his own father. Yeah? Now, Zeus fell head over hills in love with Metis. But remember, Metis was wise, and she knew that Zeus was not a good guy. And Metis definitely did not want his advances. She definitely declined his advances, but Zeus was having none of that. You know, what Zeus wants, Zeus gets. I mean, this is like stereotypical of every story associated with Zeus. And part of Meta's powers was also the ability to shapeshift. And so she would try to shapeshift to get away from Zeus. I mean, this woman was literally running because she did. I mean, I know what that's like. I think every single woman knows what that's like to be hunted down by a man that you are not attracted to. She was trying to shapeshift her way away from Zeus, but Zeus ended up trapping her. And basically, she had to submit to Zeus and she had to become his wife. Well, Gaia 
we all know Gaia, she basically came to Zeus and she gave him this prophecy. She said that you are going to have two children. The first is going to be a daughter who is going to match you in strength. And the second is going to be a son who is going to be stronger than you and overtake you in strength. Well, this terrified Zeus because as I said, he had just overtaken his father and his father before that. There was like this karmic pattern of boys in the family, like overthrowing their dads and so obviously this was Metis's fault because it's always the woman's fault especially if you're dating a narcissist a psychopathic narcissist like Zeus who basically shmapes women anytime he wants and like suckered you into having to be his wife and so because it's Metis's fault that his future children are going to be able to take him out he decides to eat Metis you heard me correct he consumes her like kind of like Jonah and the whale story from the bible where he's in the whale like Metis is now in Zeus's body now the problem you know he did this so that she wouldn't be able to get pregnant right although Zeus ain't that smart because Zeus was shmaping all the women so he could have gotten another woman pregnant which he does with Dionysus that's a different story I'll tag that video down below if you missed that one we went through Dionysus but nonetheless, when he eats Metis, um, she's already pregnant with a female. And all of a sudden, Zeus starts having these weird sensations. Now, when he eats Metis by osmosis of eating her, he acquires a lot of her power. So there's this, two, tr this transformation that happens to Zeus. But he starts to get this really bad headache like super bad headache so much so that he like asked another god to like cut his head open so he could remove the problem well the problem was his daughter athena out of his hands comes this fully grown woman in armor with an owl ready to go and thus athena emerges as the goddess of athens athena athens there's more to her story um, we're not going to go too deeply into her and Minerva's story, but I just wanted to give you the background of who Athena is. Now, a lot of us have fathers who are narcissists and psychopaths. Doesn't mean that we're narcissists and psychopaths. But Athena definitely comes from a very toxic, toxic family. And I do believe that she was a, a literal Nephilim, a literal giant that lived upon this earth and again as i've said especially when we studied the emerald tablets not all the nephilim were bad and her familiar her animal was an owl now familiar are typically animals that witches have that help give them a source of their power now a witch just means a wise woman there are good witches and there are bad witches. There are good spell casting, like good spell casting is prayer, and there are bad spell casting, right? So we have to get rid of this like black and white thinking and look at every individual case and its complexity on its own. And so Athena's familiar was an owl. And so if your familiar is something that gives you a specific source of power, then the owl obviously is giving her a specific source of enlightenment, of wisdom, of knowledge, which obviously heretically, karmically comes from her mother, Metis, who is still living in Zeus's body, you know. I feel bad for Metis. Like, if anybody's gonna need to have pity in this story, it's definitely Metis. So that's kind of the background, just the basic background of the owl that the barbarian Alumashmati decided to use as its mascot when the Society of Jesus was under its restraints in the late 1800s. Now, we know that these particular groups work under the motto, Order Out of Chaos order out of chaos we see this this is no this is this is not breaking news for us in this community now there was a, a german professor named hegel hegel lived from 1717 to 1831 so he lived during the time of the creation of the Illumishmati and also during the time where the society of jesus was more restricted and he in his philosophy, we're going to talk a little bit about him more as well and his perception on the Owl of Minerva, but he also kind of had a more um, a modern approach to this idea of order out of chaos. We say today, problem, reaction, solution. He said thesis, antithesis, and new thesis. So this is basically, now Hegel used to talk about how the owl flies at dusk. Basically, what this philosopher Hegel meant by this is that hindsight is twenty twenty. So the owl flies at dusk. 
I take this to mean, now Hegel was big. His idea was that the Western world was about to collapse. That was kind of his philosophical theory. And I kind of get what he's saying. With the owl flying at dusk, the owl being the symbol of these societies. We look now, we look back on our history, us in 2024, a few hundred years after Hegel, we look back at this idea of order out of chaos and hindsight being 2020, where we can look back and see the steps that were taken to get us into the illusion that nefarious groups wanted us in, in order to control us. These groups knew what they were doing, like an owl in the darkness, they could see. They had the wisdom. They knew what they were doing. We didn't. Not until now. I've heard my friend Jesse Zaboder talk about understanding these symbols means that you're learning a whole new language, and that is absolutely correct. I myself have spoken about the Hess Act. The Hess Act of World War II was when Hitler and the Yahtzees and the Pope created a propaganda campaign basically making divination tools of the devil so that you and I would be, become, would be dumbed down, so that we would be blind in the dark. And only certain people would continue to understand this occult language. Now, we know, again, that there's this special campground up in California where they have a big owl, just like the owl here in Atlanta. And we know that there's a lot of really bad stuff that happens in this camp campground. And it's almost like they're, they're doing ceremonies to this owl in order to, almost like Zeus, take in the wisdom of this particular animal. I also think that there's some demon summoning, too. But I hope that makes sense. If, if Zeus took in Metis against her consent and gained her life force, her knowledge, then are they using the owl and harnessing the energy and the wisdom of the owl for their own knowledge in order to dupe the world? That's kind of how I see it. Now, as you guys know, how I'm going to end this video is that I typically try to look at the Cassiopeian board to see what they have to say. And I typed in the Owl of Minerva, nothing came up. So I typed in the name of the campground in New York and I got one post that came up. And so I'm gonna pull it up just for you guys to see it. I'm not gonna read it and you'll see why I'm not gonna read it in a minute because I can't read it on this platform. So this was recently done, uh, March 9th of 2024, talking about, I'll just say Ryan. If you guys see here, Ryan was forced to watch that included at the campground, and they said yes. Now, in order to harness the information of an owl or to get a demon to give you the information or the wisdom that the animal, the owl, possesses from God, we've talked about this before. Again, the darkness cannot create anything, only the light can create. So for Lucifer or for his minions, one of the big differences between them and beings of the light is that they don't have their own substantial creating force because they're of the darkness. That is why people who serve the darkness, people who want to go 4D negative, service to self negative, that is why they have to do particular religious ceremonies, we'll say, involving these things and animals. Because there's a life force. They have to give a life force to the ent entities they're summoning so the entities that they're summoning can continue to live themselves. Once they have that energy to continue to live from a created being, then they can give over what the person paying the price or paying for it with this particular said being. I know, guys, it's confusing. I'm having to use fake words with this. You guys know what I'm saying, though. That's why these rituals take place. Right there, it's an it's an it's a payment because the darkness can't create anything. The light can create, so the light doesn't need anything to sustain its light, its life, because it is a creative force in itself. The darkness can't create, so it has to take, invert, and use to sustain its own power. So people who are craving world power, people who are craving dominance, people who are creating celebrity, uh, craving celebrity, are craving whatever earthly desire they want 
the darkness tricks them by saying, I can give you what you want, but I need something in return for you. And what they need in return from that person is the life force of something else that they, so they can continue living. I hope that makes sense. Once I think you understand that, you get why they do certain things. It's not right, but that's why they do it. Now, again, the owl itself is just a symbol of what the actual animal of the owl is known for. God created the owl. So what they're harnessing in these rituals is the, the elements, the attributes of the owl that they wish to have in order to dupe the world, to be the ones who can see in the dark, to be the ones to have the wisdom and the knowledge, hence why the Hess Act was created in the early 20th century, to take that knowledge away from us. So again, we would be in the dark and they would be the ones in the light. They would be illuminated. I hope that makes sense. So anyway, I know this was a shorter video, but I just kind of wanted to talk a little bit about the Owl of Minerva in addition to our video on the Society of Jesus. Next next in this series will be a look at St. Francis Borgia himself, who had, you know, he was kind of bedfellas with, uh, with the Society of Jesus and its origins. So anyway, guys, all those links are down in the description box below. I have, hope you're having a wonderful day, and I will talk to you soon.